the TADRIG 2020 working sessions. This is session IG06 and I'm your moderator, uh, Steve Baskoff. My co-moderator is Niels Klozenga and we're grateful for tech support from Holly Little and Beatrice Lujan. This session is gonna be recorded for later viewing. So just be aware that if you uh, talk during the session that you'll be recorded along with everything else. Um, so thank you for joining us and uh, thanks to everyone else who's participating. Our session format is going to be that we will be having some presentations and um, then at the end we'll have discussion. So the, um, the you, you will have an opportunity to unmute if you have questions so please feel free to, um, to ask your questions as we go along. I'll try to pause to see if there are questions. Um, Niels is also going to be monitoring the chat. And so if um, there's something in the chat, I'm going to, let's see if I can get the chat up here. Yeah, there we go. If I see something in the chat, I will try to answer it. Otherwise, Niels will bring it to my attention if you do, don't feel comfortable unmuting and asking the question yourself. Um, the chat function is available for technical questions, conversing with other attendees. So please use it judiciously. Um, if there's nefarious or inappropriate use of the chat, we will, may remove people from the session or disable the chat function. So please take a look at the code of conduct and, and please behave accordingly. If you're not actually <clears throat> wanting to say something, please uh, keep your microphone muted. We have, I think, something in the neighborhood of 30 plus people here, so keeping microphones muted will be um, important. And please bear with any technical difficulties that we might have, um, and hopefully everything will go smoothly. So Niels has put a Google Doc in the chat, and I am completely incompetent at trying to take notes while I'm also talking and moderating a meeting. So I am going to depend on people to just type notes in the chat. And then this note will essentially be the record of the meeting. And I'll talk about the nature of what this meeting is in just a moment. So welcome everyone and uh, let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing that uh, I want to talk about is a bit of an introduction to Audubon Corps. What is it and how does this group maintain it? Audubon Corps um, is linked from the main Tadwig web page. And uh, if you go to the Audubon Corps uh, standard page, there is a thing called an introduction document. And so that what I'm going to tell you today is basically um, a, a summary of what's on that introduction document. It's one of the two current standards that are ratified that are vocabularies. The other one besides Audubon Core is Darwin Core. So there may be other uh, vocabulary standards in the future, but right now there's only two. Um, it's described as a multimedia resources metadata schema. And I've always sort of puzzled over exactly what that means. But I think basically what that means is it's a vocabulary for talking about multimedia resources. So right now there's, there's currently a single vocabulary in Audubon Core. And there are also four documents that um, describe how to use the vocabulary. Uh, soon there may be additional vocabularies, uh, controlled vocabularies that will be added, but at this point there's only a single vocabulary. The purpose of Audubon Core is to describe both collections and the underlying media resources that are in those collections. Audubon Core creates a number of its own terms, but it also borrows vocabulary terms from uh, many other namespaces. And part of the idea of behind the Audubon Core standard is that there is this thing called an Audubon Core record. An Audubon Core record describes multimedia resources. It also can describe what we call access points. Those are ways that you can 
retrieve various forms of that abstract media resource. And uh, so people can use Audubon core terms separately from a quote unquote Audubon core record, but there's an understanding that an Audubon core record will have certain critical um, uh, required pieces of metadata. The other thing about Audubon core is it's, it is representation independent. So it's a data model, uh, an abstract sort of data model, but it doesn't have only one concrete representation. So you can use Audubon Core to, um, to represent metadata in a number of ways. Probably the most common ways is as fielded text, um, but it's also possible to represent it as linked data um, and possibly other uh, formats that people haven't thought of yet, such as JSON, LD, and so on. So there's no one particular way to do it. It's designed to be usable in a variety of different formats. So the other question that you may be wondering, since this is advertised as the Audubon Core Vocabulary Maintenance Group Annual Meeting, what exactly is a vocabulary maintenance group? The uh, vocabulary maintenance specification, which I there's a little thumbnail on the right, was a Tadwig standard adopted in 2017 that, that governs how vocabularies are managed. And so one of the things that the vo vocabulary maintenance specification says in section 2.1 is that there is a thing called a vocabulary maintenance group. So a vocabulary maintenance group is basically a special category of interest group. An interest group is a part of Tadwig's bylaws um, and is described in the Tadwig process document. So it's a special kind of an interest group whose sole purpose is to maintain one or more ratified vocabularies. Um, and so the interest group's job is basically to manage term changes and additions. And it can also charter task groups which is another built-in feature of the Tadwig process. So interest groups in general can charter task groups and vocabulary maintenance groups can char charter task groups that are tasked with coordinating developments uh, and additions to the vocabulary. So uh, in addition to these functions that are sort of laid out in the vocabulary maintenance specification, on a practical matter, our, our maintenance group maintains the documentation for the vocabulary. It maintains a communication system, which in our case is the issues tracker in our uh, GitHub repository. And it also maintains records that are related to Audubon Core. Those are also stashed in our uh, GitHub repository. The other thing that is uh, laid out in the vocabulary uh, maintenance specification is that one, at least once a year, the maintenance group should have a public meeting. And at that public meeting, uh, people can communicate with the uh, maintenance group. We actually have a lot more than one meeting per year, but this meeting that we're having today basically is our official annual meeting that we're supposed to have once a year. So just a little bit in the specific details about the Audubon Core Maintenance Group. We were chartered in 2018. Uh, we are the first group to become a vocabulary maintenance group. So we are kind of the guinea pigs. Uh, nobody really uh, uh, told us how we were supposed to do it. So we kind of made up things as we went along. Uh, our records are in the GitHub repository, which I mentioned. It's uh, the AC repository in github.com slash Tadwig, T-D-W-G. Uh, and so basically, this is the place that you can go to find out pretty much all, um, much of the information about the group. The, the sort of default uh, way to know what is going on with the Audubon Core Maintenance Group is to go to uh, the GitHub repository and then watch the repository. There's a little button you can click that says watch. And if you have your GitHub um, account figured up, 
uh, uh, sorry, if you have your GitHub account configured correctly, you can get emails or other sorts of notifications each time something changes in the issues tracker. So for example, uh, when we are holding meetings, those are posted in the issues tracker so people can find out whenever our next meeting is gonna be and receive notifications about that if they're watching the repository. We have six core members that are listed on the repository landing page. Uh, and the convener, which is me, order, uh, organizes periodic Zoom calls. On average, we have one probably about once every one to two months, depending on what's going on. We've had actually a lot going on this year, so we've uh, a lot of the year we've met about once a month. So what does it mean to be a member of the maintenance group if you're not one of the core members? Well, basically um, anybody who cares about what Audubon Core is doing is essentially a regular member. Tadwig is not about voting on things. It's really about consensus. So there are no issues like who gets to vote on things. If you participate and join in the calls, then you are uh, basically able to have a voice in what the group does and uh, help us to achieve consensus about what we should be doing. I mentioned that one of the th functions that a maintenance group can do is to charter task groups. Currently, Audubon Core has two task groups, the 3D task group and the views task group. And we will be hearing reports from those groups a little bit later, so I won't go into more details about that. Um, where, uh, just to be a little more specific, where are the Audubon Core materials? I have had people complain that um, when you Google Audubon Core, you get sent to all sorts of strange places that don't seem to be relevant. So there are essentially two main places where you should go if you want to know about Audubon Core. So the first thing is go to the standards landing page. If you go to www.tadwig.org, there's a button at the, clock, at the top to click on standards. And then once you get to that page, there's a button to click on for, for Audubon Core. That will take you to the Audubon Core standards landing page. That's the, basically the official starting off point to find out about Audubon Core. There are links to all of the documents that are official parts of Audubon Core and, and critically to the term list, which lays out all the terms that are part of the vocabulary. The other thing, uh, as I mentioned, is the GitHub repository. That's um, github.com slash tadwig dot slash ac. Uh, we have, a, all of the Tadwig groups have quote unquote community pages and there is some information there, but we don't actively maintain that page because we basically do all of our work on GitHub. So if you go to the community page, you're not going to find the same kinds of link outs that you would find in our GitHub repository. We've been working this year to sort of decommission all of these obsolete um, uh, sources of information and to try to funnel people to these two places. But um, if you haven't been able to find out about Audubon Core, these are the main places to go. And then, as I mentioned, a critical part of our communication structure is the issues tracker, which is uh, the issues tab on the GitHub repository. It, it serves two purposes. One, as I mentioned, it's where we announce things like when we're having meetings and how you can participate. But the other important piece of it is that that's where term proposals live. And we'll be going through the issue tracker later on in the meeting and looking at the current term proposals. So if you have a suggestion for um, something that you'd like to see become a part of Audubon Core, the issue tracker is the place where you put that. Okay, so I've been giving some marathon notes uh, about Audubon Core and the maintenance group. I'll pause for just a moment to give people a chance to ask question, questions, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of what is supposed to happen during this meeting.
All right, I don't see any burning questions coming up in the chat or anybody unmuting, so I'll go ahead and uh, proceed with the, uh, describing the purpose of the meeting. So I mentioned that the vocabulary maintenance specification says that there's supposed to be what's called an annual review. And uh, I put the little relevant section of the specification on the right here. Basically, um, this meeting is our annual review meeting. And the things that we're supposed to do is to hear reports from the task groups. Um, I actually am the, uh, the convener of one of the task groups, so I'll talk about that. And, and then Doug Boyer, who's go hopefully going to join the call later, is the other task group convener, and he'll talk about what the 3D group is doing. The other thing that um, we're supposed to do is review open issues that are in the tracker. So we will do that. Um, we have several um, of the issues which are actually in the 30-day public comment period. And so we'll specifically give people an opportunity to ask about those uh, because that 30-day comment period is ending at the end of September. And then at the end of the meeting, we will have some general, uh, an opportunity for people to ask general questions and also um, to get some input from those who are interested in the work of the group about what our priorities should be for the coming year. So that's what we are hoping to accomplish. So we will uh, at this point move on to a report of some of the activities of what the group has been doing during the last year. So as I mentioned, um, the maintenance group has been meeting, uh, I don't know how many meetings we've had, eight or ten meetings uh, over the last year. And we take meeting notes as the part uh, uh, through a Google Doc and then basically post those meeting notes in our GitHub repository. So anybody who wants to know what we did, uh, Tadwig is an a public and open group. You can review the meetings and see everything we talked about uh, in the historical folder of the GitHub repository. Um, but I'm going to just highlight a few of the main things that we accomplished over the last year. Uh, one of the big things that um, happened was that we released the January 2020, January 27 version of Audubon Core. So um, this is kind of a big deal for us. First of all, it's the first new version that, of Audubon Core that's been released since the vocabulary was uh, adopted, originally adopted. And it's also noteworthy, noteworthy that this is the first uh, version release of, of any of Tadwig's vocabularies since the vocabulary maintenance specification was um, adopted. And so again, we were sort of guinea pigs with this whole process. Uh, it went pretty smoothly. Uh, so we're happy about that. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of details. I've, I've listed some of the things that we accomplished in this revision. Mostly it was a cleanup. Um, there were some parts of term meta metadata that were misplaced in the term definitions and usage guidelines and so on. So we kind of cleaned that up. We implemented RFC 2119 keywords um, and also uh, decommissioned the terms wiki, which is where Audubon Core used to live. And so Essentially, what, we're, what we have done is implemented a new management system that, uh, that allows us to make changes mm -hmm. and regenerate the documentation through a scripted process rather than having to manually edit a bunch of documents using um, the, the, uh, a wiki structure. So this is sort of a general strategy that, that Tadwig is taking with maintaining vocabularies. And so this version release was basically a test case for uh, rebuilding uh, term documents uh, using the scripted process. So um, basically it was a big cleanup 
the first cleanup of the vocabulary since it was originally adopted. The other thing that we spent a lot of time on uh, in the second half of the year was some sound proposals. I am not going to talk a lot about this uh, because Dan uh, Stoll is going to um, talk about it later on. Um, but we basically solicited a lot of experts' uh, opinions, uh, got some information from sound, various sound archives, and then tried to come up with a strategy for term additions and some more uh, broader proposals for how those terms should be used. So this was a focus of uh, a number of our meetings. And if you want to know the details, you can look at the meeting, meeting notes. But uh, Dan is going to basically tell us more about this later on when he reports on it. The last main thing that we accomplished um, was the development of three controlled vocabularies for existing terms that are in Audubon Core. And um, so just a little background about this. Audubon Core was, was ratified before there was a vocabulary maintenance specification. So it wasn't exactly clear how Audubon Core would be maintained at the time that it was adopted. And so in the original version of Audubon Core, there were a lot of places where it said that some sort of vague communities of interest would establish controlled vocabularies. Uh, there wasn't any like clarity about what exactly a community of interest was and uh, what that meant. So effectively what that means at this point is that the Audubon Core maintenance group uh, behaves as the community of interest. And so rather than leaving the uh, rather vague statements uh, about these uh, within the terms saying that some nebulous community of interest is going to develop a controlled vocabulary, uh, we took that upon ourselves to actually develop the controlled vocabularies. And um, also, we, the standards documentation specification, which didn't exist at the time that Audubon Corps was ratified, does now exist. So we look to that for guidance on how to actually um, construct those controlled vocabularies. So I'm not going to say anything more about that right now because we will be looking specifically at those proposals later on. Um, but as I said, they are in the midst of public comment and through the end of September. And then based on the comments that we get, we will make revisions as necessary and submit them to the Tadwig executive. And if the Tadwig executive uh, approves the changes, then they will become a part of Audubon Core. So I mentioned that right now Audubon Core is a single vocabulary, which is the, the vocabulary that contains the uh, properties and classes. So this would essentially add three additional mini vocabularies that would be the controlled vocabulary terms to be used as values for three of the properties that form a part of the main uh, Audubon core vocabulary. So more details on this later. So um, that is essentially what the main Audubon core maintenance group worked on over the last year. So now I'm going to um, take off my maintenance group convener hat and put on my views task group convener hat and talk about what we did. So the views task group is, okay, why did I just go out of presentation mode? Didn't mean to do that. All right, the, um, the VIEWS task group basically is a group who was tasked with developing controlled vocabularies for two particular Audubon core terms. The term subject part, which, is, which indicates uh, what part of the uh, organism or specimen is being featured in the media item. And then subject orientation, which is, a va it, which is basically a, what direction are you looking at that part 
when the uh, image, or I guess it's generally a still image, when this image was taken of that subject part. So these two terms, subject part and subject orientation, uh, we return, refer to them collectively as the view of the organism that's featured in the media item. And so our task group's job was to try to come up with a controlled vocabulary for that. As with the uh, main maintenance group, there are uh, records of the meetings that we held uh, in the GitHub repository. If you go to the, the Audubon core GitHub repository, there's a a folder called views and that's the place where all of our stuff is at. Um, you can find the, the list of the core members, um, Neil Cobb, Matthew Nielsen, Randy Singer and I are the core members of that group. Martin Steen uh, was a member of the group but then he changed jobs and had to leave mid-year so, um, so he dropped out of the group but he uh, contributed for the first half of the year. So if you're interested in the work of the group, uh, please feel free to go check that out and our contact information is there. Uh, so the accomplishments of the task group are as follows. Uh, one of the <laughs> things we did, I think, was to get our charter approved. It's a little bit unclear exactly when that happened, but uh, anyway, we are operating at least as if our charter was approved. I think it was. Um, we've had seven meetings um, and those meetings went through May and then basically at uh, in May in May I got really busy with other things and so I didn't convene any meetings after that so we're hoping to pick things up again uh, on our work soon. One of the things that we did was to identify potential uh, potential users of these controlled vocabularies and then we solicited use cases from those users. So one of the parts of the uh, process that's laid out in the vocabulary maintenance specification is how you uh, go about creating uh, what's known as a vocabulary enhancement. So a vocabulary enhancement is basically a coordinated addition to a vocabulary. I would say just honestly, in the past, Tadwig has been pretty terrible at this. Tadwig has a tendency to create specifications and then find out if they work later. Uh, the, most of our peer organizations do it the other way around, which is to come up with use cases, uh, come up with uh, solutions, test them out, and then if they work, add them to the standards. And so one of the things that, this ta that our task group was trying to do is to follow these best practices, which is to establish the requirements of what it is we want these controlled vocabularies to do, and then hopefully get some people to try implementing them before we actually propose adding them uh, as controlled vocabularies. So the stage we are in right now is basically we, we took the use cases, developed uh, some candidate requirements, and we're now in the, uh, at the point of actually um, assembling the potential values for subject part. And then when we finish that, we will establish potential values for subject orientation because that depends, the orientation that's appropriate depends somewhat on the part that you're looking at. So we're going to take that up second. So anyway, we, we, that's essentially what we're in the middle of doing. And then, as I said, in about May, I got busy and didn't convene any meetings after that. So that's totally on me. But anyway, we're behind a bit on our timeline in our charter, but um, I don't think any Tadwood task group has ever finished their work on time. So I'm not going to worry about that too much. Okay, so that's basically my report on the, the VIEWS task group. Again, I'm gonna pause here. And if anybody has any questions about um, what, what the group is doing, what it means, uh, you can either unmute and ask or uh, put it in the chat.
Okay, I don't see anything coming up. So, as I said, there'll be plenty of time for questions later on. So if you're, if I didn't give you enough time to ask your question, please feel free to ask it um, later on during the meeting. So the other task group that we have operating is the 3D task group. And um, Doug Boyer told me he was good. He's the convener of that task group. Um, I don't think he's here yet. Doug, are you here? He's not here yet, Steve. Okay. So I, what I told him was that when he got here, we would let him give his report. So at this point, we'll just defer on that. And um, so I was originally going to let uh, Dan talk about this, what the sound group did then, but um, his presentation also includes information about the actual proposals. So I think what I'll do is defer on having him talk about that uh, and until we get to the point of actually talking about the proposal. So um, he can review sort of what we did and then go into discussing what is actually being proposed. Mm, that's fine. Okay, thanks, Dan. So I mentioned that um, we have several, uh, it, so actually, let me just go on here and say, um, yeah, okay, this threw me out of presentation mode, so that's fine. That means I can just go here to, um, Okay, so I'm going to the Tadwig GitHub repo. Let me make this bigger. And uh, this is what the Tadwig repo looks like. And then if you go to the issues tracker, um, I've been working really hard to beat down the number of issues. You can see we have 159 issues closed and only 14 left open. Uh, so I'm feeling really happy about that. The actual things that are up for um, uh, public comment and and to be included in our next release uh, are the ones that have the little pink public comment tags. You can also click on milestones here and this will basically take you directly to the proposals. So these are the things that we uh, have going on right now. The first three proposals are um, the, the three controlled vocabularies, and then the remaining ones are the ones relating to sound proposals, and those are the ones that uh, Dan is going to talk about. So, um, so a couple general uh, comments about the um, controlled vocabulary proposals. So, at a number of places, I mentioned how um, Audubon Core has been sort of the guinea pig for uh, working out the bugs on some of the new procedures that Tadwig has established uh, with respect to how vocabularies are maintained. And so the three controlled vocabularies that we have proposed are sort of fall into the same category in that these are these are guinea pigs. There's been a lot of uh, discussion about uh, controlled vocabularies, how they're documented, what they actually are. So the three controlled vocabularies that we have under public comment right now and three proposed controlled vocabularies in Darwin Core are the, um, the first six controlled vocabularies that uh, would be part of, Tad, of Tadwig standards. And so we are sort of working out in the process how you do this. What is a controlled vocabulary? How do you document it? And so on. So I'm going to just talk for a moment about what exactly uh, it means to have a controlled vocabulary. So there are three sets of terms that are listed at the bottom of the slide. Um, they're 
each of the sets of terms represents a pair of terms. So for example, Audubon core variant and Audubon core variant literal is one pair. Audubon core subtype, Audubon core subtype literal is another pair. And then DC terms format and DC format is another pair. So why are these in pairs? Well, one of the um, things that underlies Audubon core is that for a number of, uh, for a number of properties, the property could have values that are either strings, in linked data we would say those are literal values, or IRIs, which uh, is sort of the modern version of URIs or URLs. So if a term can have a value that's either an IRI or a string literal, then there are generally two terms in Audubon core for that. And the one term, so for example, in the first pair, Audubon core variant. Audubon core variant is to have a value that is an IRI. If you want to provide a string literal, then you use the other term in the pair, Audubon core variant literal. So in the controlled vocabularies, for each value, there are two possible um, forms of that value. One is an IRI and the other is a controlled value string. The IRI that's defined would go, would be used if you used AC variant. The controlled value string is what you would use if you were using variant literal. There is an analog if you're a, if you're uh, if you are aware of the work of Darwin Core, Darwin Core also has the same kind of pairs of analogs. The terms in the main DWC namespace are intended for literal values, and the DWC IRI namespace terms are intended to have uh, values that are IRIs. So this uh, sort of means of defining a controlled vocabulary in terms of minting an IRI and also uh, denoting a controlled value string. This is a part of sort of the, the new um, newly tried out system for, uh, for defining controlled vocabularies. Um, the other thing is that the standards documentation specification um, indicates that, that SCOS is the appropriate means for um, describing metadata of controlled values. Uh, SCOS stands for Simple Knowledge Organization System. It's a, it's a W3C standard for basically controlled vocabularies. So um, in the proposals, you will see some SCOS terms like SCOS broader and SCOS uh, exact match um, that are used in the metadata for some of these terms. So again, this is kind of a new thing for Tadwig and we are the guinea pigs in terms of um, trying this out. So uh, I'm going to talk about each of the three uh, controlled vocabularies just briefly. Um, but as I said, you um, can go here and read the detailed proposals by clicking uh, on these links here. Um, and I'm not going to go over all the gory details, but we do uh, welcome comments. So if you have a GitHub account and if you are on the Tadwig a uh, team, or I don't know what it's called. If you are, if you're a member of Tadwig GitHub, you can just go into the issue tracker and make a comment. I believe that if you're not on the Tadwig uh, like GitHub team, you will not be allowed to make comments. But that's fine. Um, my uh, email address is uh, right on the landing page of the repository. Uh, here it is right here. So if you want to make comments and you're not able to, please uh, feel free to just email me and I will put your comments uh, in there. Okay, so the, um, the, the three sets of terms that we are creating controlled vocabularies for I'm going to start from the simplest and go to the most complex. The first one is variant and variant 
literal. So these two terms already had a uh, description of the accepted values in their uh, term metadata at the point at which Audubon Core was ratified. So the, the values that you should use have already been specified. So there shouldn't be anything controversial about this proposal because essentially uh, all we really did was to just um, take what was already listed previously in the, the definitions and uh, put those into the form of a, uh, of a, a, a SCOS controlled vocabulary scheme. So if you go to this proposal and click, on, it says here, a draft of the control vocabulary is here. Um, here's basically the list. So um, for example, so a variant is essentially one of the formats that a media item can have. So you can see a media item can have a thumbnail. If it's a video, it can have a trailer. It can have a lower quality, uh, Val, uh, a format, medium quality, best quality, and so on. So these categories were have are the same ones that have always been specified. And what we are doing essentially here is to mint URIs for them. And those URIs are what you would use as a value for AC variant. If you use AC variant literal, you would use this controlled uh, vocabulary here and then there's a term definition. So these controlled vocabularies, uh, are, this is fairly straightforward. The um, controlled vocabulary for subtype and subtype literal uh, is also, shouldn't be controversial because as with variant, the values that were recommended for this have already been specified since the ratification of Audubon core. So all we are doing in that case, again, is just taking uh, what was already a part uh, uh, listed within the Audubon core term metadata itself and just uh, basically spinning it off into a controlled vocabulary. So once again, uh, a draft of the proposed controlled vocabulary is here uh, for Oh, wait, sorry, I clicked on the same thing over again. My mistake here. Uh, subtype. Okay, so subtypes, here you can see a list of all of the subtype terms by, by label. So essentially, uh, Dublin Core provides uh, only basic types such as uh, still image, moving image, sound, and I don't know, I think there's something for 3D models. Or, but, but that's not a very specific way of describing what the media item is. So the Audubon core subtype um, term, a, a subtype and subtype literal allows a provider to um, uh, be more specific about what kind of thing the media item is. And this list of subtypes are essentially the ones that have always been available to use as values. And we are simply formalizing that by defining each of these terms. So we've generated term IRIs, um, also controlled value strings that should be used. And then um, I, basically stole definitions from the Getty Arts and Architecture Thesaurus, and that's how I defined what each of these things meant. So again, this is not a particularly controversial thing. All we're really doing is basically formalizing what has already existed as the recommended values for those terms. The last proposal is the most complicated one, um, so Dublin Core format uh, is, the, the controlled vocabulary is complicated. There are many possible values. 
and this controlled vocabulary is likely to change over time. It's likely to get bigger as more format types are either discovered or created. Um, the other thing is that although Audubon Core is minting this controlled vocabulary, it's designed to be generic mm -hmm. so that any Tadwig standard that needs to have a controlled vocabulary for uh, DC terms format uh, could use it. It also is the only one of these three vocabularies that, that actually uses these SCOS terms defining broader categories and that certain terms are exact matches of other terms. Um, so if we go to the controlled vocabulary for format um, and then look at the draft, you can see that uh, it's huge. So it's not very easy to scan through all of the different terms because there's so many of them. Uh, but this listing here basically, it, it lists all of the types of, uh, of files that uh, are likely to be encountered for media items. Um, so for example, JPEG or uh, PDF or TIFF are all listed here. And this control vocabulary actually has two different um, schemes. The original definition of, uh, or the usage guidelines uh, that already exist in Audubon Core say that um, you can provide values that are either file extensions or uh, a a internet media type. And so this, uh, that's one of the reasons why this controlled vocabulary is a little more complicated because there are basically two concept schemes. One concept scheme for the IANA media types, another one based on conventional file extensions. And so if you look at these lists, you'll see um, that basically we have one list of all the file extensions, another one of all the media types. And then the other thing which is considered to be a bit weird by some people is that we also have um, included in the media types physical media concepts. So what does that mean? It is possible to have a Darwin Core, uh, sorry, an Audubon Core record for a physical media item that is not available through the internet. So for example, if you're an art museum and you have a painting of a plant, you could create an Audubon core record of that painting and there's no way to deliver that painting through the internet. So in that case, we're not providing a service access point that tells people how to get that painting we are just simply describing that it is a part of a collection. And so this uh, media types and physical media concept scheme includes a number of things like reel-to-reel -reel audio tape, uh, physical artworks, photographic prints and slides. So these are types of media that can be described but that cannot be delivered. Any of the ones that have file extensions, obviously um, you would consider to be at least potentially deliverable through the internet. So this scheme, that's one of the reasons for the complexity is this scheme allows both kinds of things. The other thing, um, and I'm not gonna go into the gory details in the interest of time, but there's the file extension concepts are defined to have exact matches in the media type. So for example, if you have um, a media type of like application slash PDF, that's defined to be exactly the same as a media item that has a file extension of PDF. So the idea is that if a, an image provider provides one of these types of controlled vocabulary terms in the description of the media item, it's possible to convert it to the other type. So if a provider gives the file extension, uh, this controlled vocabulary will allow a, a machine or, a, a, or software to determine what the 
corresponding IN, uh, IANA media type would be that goes with that um, file extension. So uh, at, the, at the risk of going off into the weeds and the technical details, um, I, I'm just going to stop there. And if people um, have uh, questions, I can answer them. OK, and I see there are, in fact, um, quest some questions in the, in the chat. So the question, let's see, the most recent question is, are IRIs preferred over literals? Can you briefly explain the advantages and disadvantages? So um, I believe that in some cases, the documentation says that IRIs are preferred. Um, for all practical purposes, providing the controlled value string is equivalent to providing the IRI. The main reason for having the IRI value terms is to at least potentially in the future allow for uh, the use of linked data. So if you are, uh, if you're into linked data, one of the things that you know is that when a term has a value that's an IRI, it's possible to link that to additional information about that value. If the value is, is a string literal, it's not possible to make any additional links. How likely anyone is able uh, to be to make additional links about these things, I don't know. But like, um, at least in theory, if you used an IRI for, say, uh, JPEG, then that would potentially allow a, a linked data client to go discover more things about like what is a JPEG. If you use the string value, then that's basically the end of the line. So, um, you know, if, for, for a practical, the practical purpose, if you're providing uh, Audubon core data in a spreadsheet, uh, it doesn't really matter that much which one you use. Um, I think that the preference towards IRIs partly comes out of the fact that IRIs are by their nature globally unique. One of the reasons for the interest in developing controlled vocabularies is that in the past there's just been a huge proliferation of values for terms. If, if people provide strings, sometimes they capitalize them, sometimes they don't capitalize them, sometimes they camel case them, and so there ends up being a major disambiguation task when people provide strings. Obviously, if people are strict in using the specified controlled value strings, then that problem goes away. But I think one of the reasons it, with IRIs is basically you can't make a mis you can't make that sort of mistake. But for all practical purposes, they're they're more or less equivalent. Uh, let's see. Okay, in general, people can comment on anything in GitHub. I guess that's true, although I was involved in a meeting where people were supposed to, may, maybe you can comment and not create the issues. Maybe that's it. I don't know. Um, anyway, <laughs> go ahead and try to comment on the, these issues. And if you're not able to, let me know. Uh, another question. Has there been any discussion about whether terms in controlled vocabulary should be capitalized or all lowercase? OK, that's a great question. So at a meeting last year, there was discussion about whether uh, it's more appropriate to have uh, opaque IRIs. So you know, what should be the form of the IRIs and what should be the form of the uh, controlled value strings. Um, so generally, I have taken the position that for controlled value IRIs, it's probably better to use um, to make them opaque. So you'll notice that the term IRIs uh, are just numbers here. Uh, 
and I, I'm not going to go into a defense of that other than to say that it seemed like there was uh, more people thought that was a good idea than not. Um, IRIs are, for all practical purposes, designed for machines to use and not so much for people. So um, people who are using spreadsheets are going to probably be more uh, comfortable providing the controlled string value, and that's fine. People who want to do linked data are going to be doing the IRIs, and the fact that it's opaque will not bother them. As far as the controlled value strings, I would pref I think that probably the best thing to do is lower camel case. And so in the cases where we don't have uh, an existing value that was previously specified, I generally uh, tried to use um, lower camel case. However, if you look at the proposals, you'll see that on at least one of them, that's not the case. And that's because Audubon Core already previously specified um, controlled value strings that were capitalized with spaces in them, which I totally don't like, but I also am a firm believer that in the interest of not breaking pre-existing implementations, we shouldn't change things that are already uh, in place. So I, I would advocate that in the cases of creating new controlled values, that we avoid uh, spaces and that we follow some convention like lower camel case. But there's no official Tadwig policy on this. It's really more going to be a kind of precedence that we're setting by creating these uh, initial controlled vocabularies. Um, okay, so did that, uh, Ian, did that answer your question? Uh, let's see, I don't think Audubon Core gives recommendations when providing link string over URI. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I think there are a few terms where it says like if there's any uh, disagreement between the string value, if both values are provided, then there's a disagreement that the URI value is takes precedent or something like that. I didn't make this up. That's, that's what was already there. But I think that there, as I said, for all practical purposes, a controlled value string should be able to be translated into an IRI and vice versa. So as a practical matter, it shouldn't matter which one you use. Okay. Um, any thoughts on different approaches used by Darwin Core and Audubon Core distinguishing IRIs from literals? Ah. In the namespace versus the main part of the term. Yeah, well, um, so just a little bit of history about this. So in Darwin Core, the whether a term is intended for use with IRIs or literals is determined by the namespace. If it is, if the namespace is DWC IRI. It, uh, you essentially must use an IRI. If it's in the main Darwin Core namespace DWC, then it's assumed that it'll probably be a literal value, a string literal value, although there may be, uh, because those terms have been around for a long time, there may be some people who don't use them in that way. Um, this was a decision that was made uh, at, there was an IDIG bio meeting that I was at, and I basically got as many people in a room as possible and asked what we should do. And at that point, uh, the consensus seemed to be create a separate namespace because that's essentially what Dublin Core does. Well, then a little bit later, when Audubon Core was created, the Audubon Core um, task group decided to use the other approach. And I was not a member of that task group and they decided to create different local names with the local names having literal on them if they're for literals. I don't actually know what the reason was for the decision. So we essentially now have two different precedents, one in Audubon Core and one in Darwin Core. And I'm not sure 
that anybody, um, I, I think perhaps the reason for having different local names and putting literal on there is that people might get confused by the namespace approach. So I don't know, there isn't really a, 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 a clear precedent on this. And I, I don't think the technical architecture group has come out with any statement saying that one is better than the other. Okay, question. Is it possible to propose the creation of a term related to a multimedia item that does not currently exist in your term list? If yes, how is the workflow for this? The answer is definitely yes. Um, this is where I think the distinction of if you are able to create an issue or not comes in. If you are able to create an issue in our issue tracker, then um, you, can, you can create an issue basically saying that you want to propose a new term. Another alternative would be to show up at the next um, meeting that we have and, and pitch the idea for your term, that's actually probably better. Uh, in terms of the actual workflow, um, what would happen is we would, uh, the, the maintenance group would uh, basically try to poll the community and find out how many people are interested in having this term. Um, the, it, I don't know that we have a policy uh, Darwin Core has a policy that at least two different people say need to say that they need it. Since terms are used for transfer of data from one person to another, if there aren't at least two people who want to transfer the data, then obviously there's no demand for the term. So the maintenance group would have to determine whether there was demand for the term and whether it looks like it would work. And if that is the case, then it would get proposed uh, th then the maintenance group would uh, move it forward into a 30-day public comment period similar to what's happening with these proposals here. So I think probably the short answer to that would be um, come to one of our maintenance group meetings and and pitch the idea and we can try to make that uh, try to make it happen. That's essentially what's happening with the sound terms that uh, Dan's going to talk about. Okay, so I think at this point, uh, we're already over an hour into the meeting. It's time for me to stop talking. And uh, we are ready for uh, Dan to talk about the sound proposals. So let me see if I can okay. stop sharing. And also, Steve, Doug has arrived. Oh, Doug has arrived. Um, Okay, so the main thing is I want to make sure, so Doug, can you do 10 minutes or less on your report? Sure. Okay. All right. Well, let's let, Doug, since we deferred on the task group um, reports, Doug can talk for um, 10 minutes or less about the 3D task group, and then we'll turn things over to Dan. Go ahead, Doug. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, yeah, so we've been working on uh, developing terms for 3D media uh, for the last for the last couple of years uh, in fits and starts, um, kind of semi coordinating with some other groups who are investigating um, community standards for for 3D file formats. Um, I think the you know the biggest challenge is that it's there is a lot of diversity of file formats. Um, and that stems from the fact that there's a lot of different ways to create 3D media. Um, at this point, I think we have a, uh, so, so I think, you know, when we first started to, trying to define the scope, we had a lot of, we had some difficulty there um, because the, the question was sort of how, how in the weeds do we need to get in terms of describing the, you know, exact method by which a given image was created and so what we pretty much settled on was that really all we want to do is describe the basics of, of an image in terms of, you know, what kind of imaging modality was used for it, what kind of um, uh, 3D resource is, is represented, which is different from the modality, uh, because there's a lot of different things you can do with um, creating different kinds of derivatives of 3D data. And then we wanted to provide metadata that would, um, as well as possible, 
allow that, that file to be interpreted um, in the most accurate way possible. Um, it's uh, because, you know, of course, when you have a 3D object, uh, there, the, the, there's a very uh, strong temptation to try to measure it and interpret it as if it was a real object. Uh, it's a little bit different from, you know, if you're just looking at a 2D photograph, you sort of understand that, you know, this, you have to be careful with the scale, you know, the perspective that you're looking at it, you can't interpret that as, as um, you know, a completely faithful representation of the object. But with 3D, um, because it looks so real, uh, we have to make sure that uh, we have all the metadata there, uh, guaranteeing to the degree that we can that it's, that it's accurate. So um, let's see, I think the best uh, thing, so we, we proposed, uh, I think around 15 terms. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at, uh, at other, other vocabularies that we hoped we could borrow from. So in particular, we spent a good amount of time looking at uh, DICOM, uh, which, is a, which is a controlled vocabulary mostly designed for describing um, different kinds of medical imaging events, MRI, CT, X-ray, um, but, you know, but also other, other, a good number of other modalities. Um, it's, really not, it's really not focused on 3D per se, and there is a lot of, um, but what is focused on 3D is mostly focused on volumetric scans. Um, but of course, there's a, a, in the biodiversity community, um, there's a growing number of, of uh, researchers creating uh, line of sight scans um, as well. So there's lots of photogrammetry, um, structured light scanning, laser scanning that's going on. Um, and that all has to be addressed. And that's not very well covered by, by DICOM. So in the end, we did have to create um, a, a number of terms um, and I'll just, let's see, I'm trying to think for the best place to kind of, I'm going to show a, a document that we've written up. I, I would say the stage we're at is we're, you know, we're pretty happy with the term list. Um, we have to um, take a little more time considering some controlled vocabularies that we're proposing. Um, and then we need to do some implementation tests, you know, and if I had to stop, stop there, that's, you know, that I think that gives you a sense of where we're at. So, we're really at this point. Um, uh, the committee has to kind of just make sure they agree that we're at where we want to be with the list, and uh, and we have to start a um, we have to find some potential uh, guinea pigs, uh, some groups that want to try documenting their resources uh, with the terms list that we put together, um, and then trying to essentially mutually share those uh, those data sets and see if they can be interpreted adequately. Um, maybe I'll just stop there for a minute before I show anything to see if anyone has particular questions or um, comments. No. If anyone wants to see sort of a, a detailed dis, uh, discussion of what we have, um, I did give a presentation on um, what we've done here for the, uh, for the Digital, the IDIG Bio, Bio Digital Data 2020 conference. I can link that and then you can sort of look through that. Um, and uh, that also mentions some, some resources that we have posted that you can, that you can go to. Um, can you, uh, if you can put that in the uh, meeting notes. notes, Doug, that would be great. You okay. can do it later. That's better. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that later. So um, anyway, I could, talk for a long time, so I'm, try I'm going to try to avoid doing that and let, and um, maybe just, just stop there unless there are particular areas that people want me to go into detail on. Um, so there's a question, yep. how do we volunteer as a guinea pig for the 3D oh. test cases? Um, yes, yes, send me, that's, that's thank you. Um, that's, uh, just send me, send me an email. Um, I'll put my email um, in, the, um, in the notes as, as well. I should say we. I think uh, you know, from as the convener of the of the committee, my time has been a little bit scattered, um, and we're over the last couple of months we're getting ready to um, launch a new um, a new a new um, improved pl software platform for the Morphosource 3D repository, 
Um, that is taking literally all my time. We're aiming for the launch of that in about a month. Um, so after that, I think, you know, um, will will be a time to really get moving on uh, test cases for um, for the new vocabulary. All right, thanks a lot, Doug, for that report. And um, hopefully we'll have time at the end for additional questions if anybody thinks of things they wanna ask. So at this point, um, let's turn things over to Dan to talk about the um, pending, uh, well, the work that uh, they've been doing on sound, the pending proposals, and then sort of where they wanna go from here. All right, thanks. Can you just confirm? Can you see my cursor? Yes. Fantastic. All right, so there's um, th there's two of us presenting this, so uh, I'll speak, but Ed will speak as well. So hello, everyone. My name is Dan Stowell, uh, and uh, with Ed Baker, we're both in the UK. And uh, yeah, so we work a lot with sound uh, collections. So um, as discussed, new terms for sound recordings. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of examples just to just to uh, sort of illustrate things for people who may be less familiar with sound examples. I don't think we really need the context slide because we have lots of context already uh, about what Audubon Core is. So um, examples, I want to start with one from, uh, it's, it's quite nice with GBIF. So if you go to uh, GBIF, you can search for observations and you can search uh, for observations that include audio. Uh, here I've searched for a particular parakeet in the UK and you get a lovely map of where they are. Uh, so now here I'm zooming in on a particular example. So um, there is the standard all the observation data here, also a media playback link. Um, this item that's been collected onto GBIF actually comes from Zuno Canto, this other uh, service. And so we've got the observation as well as some an actual audio recording um, that's been aggregated from Zuno Canto uh, through into GBIF. So for me, that's quite a nice and motivating example. Um, a little bit more specifically, uh, here's a, a very, I've just taken a screenshot of a piece of software called Raven Pro, which is quite commonly used to annotate audio data. And we have, uh, so here's a, a sound file and what is quite common, and I'm going to come back to this later, what is quite common is for the, the vocalizations within a sound recording. to people draw boxes around them, little boxes, which indicate the start time, the end time, the low frequency, the high frequency. Um, and of course we can trim the sound file down to this little bit here. Oh, by the way, what you're looking at here is the spectrograms. So this is a kind of frequency representation of the audio data. But this is part of the, the very common way that these things are produced. Uh, and also frequency data is quite important for various purposes in sound recordings. Um, Ed, if you could turn your microphone on and tell us what this one is, this is your example. So this is, I guess, part of the argument for the terms we've got later. But um, so I guess it was birds, your previous example. Yes. Which um, quite often sing with like gaps between the parts of the song. Um, if, if you move to insects, often they sing continuously throughout the recording. So there's not necessarily a good bounding box apart from the start and end of the recording. Um, but due to the way they produce sound, the frequencies are, tend to be fairly fixed and consistent. So the, the two examples here, one's a mole cricket on the left and one's a cicada. And they show that it, it's pretty stereotyped song. The frequency doesn't change. So these lines don't go up or down. And it's justifying the terms we're proposing later, which cover the frequency range at the moment, but not the time range. Yeah, so um, the, the, there's a contract, the, the bounding box here sort of has four um, aspects to it, but they are relatively independent, funnily enough. Um, so what we're talking about here is we're presenting uh, some new terms which uh, we are proposing 
about uh, their, their own GitHub already as issues uh, and some terms we're specifically proposing. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit more about annotation in more detail, which is just for um, something for us to discuss more widely as a community, I think. Uh, yeah, Ed, do you want to speak to this one? Mapping of AC terms. Um, so this is um, like, this is going to take a while to fully cover sound collections. So this is um, basically how we started prioritizing what we're doing. So we, we went to um, a number of quite big collections, looked at their existing meta metadata models, um, mapped, the, the, mapped those models to order and core as far as we could. So we end up with a list of terms which are used commonly in sound collections, but don't have a appropriate term in Audubon core. And so that's the priority we've done this time round, is just getting the basics covered. So um, if you go to the next slide, Dan, I think. So this is what we did, we just went through the metadata. This example's from Bioacoustica. So the fields used in that project on the left, the Audubon core maps on the right. And we did this for all of those collections and found out which were which were common metadata fields for sound, but which don't have a audium audible core map. So over there. Yeah, that's what I said. And this is these are the priorities we came up with. So there's some kind of a really basic essential metadata, things like sample rate, which are really important for any kind of audio analysis. And then we we did an exercise, we went through some use cases of how people do research from audio data. And the, set, the second set of terms are, are based on that. So um, we think it's a pretty solid set of initial proposals. Um, there will be other things coming later, but just to get this started on the audio stuff, this is how we came up with what we've proposed. Mm. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this. Various um, sources consulted. We've been sort of um, actually within the sort of bioacoustics community. We've been talking about some of these things um, ongoing, and uh, so there's also uh, reference here to to some work that Ed uh, is just about published right now about um, bioacoustic terminology for insects, which goes into more depth, of course. Um, we also spent a bit of time looking at related data standards from other domains, and there are a few different um, the few different uh, data standards around there, especially for music data, since there's a lot of um, industry uh, data exchange over there. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the uh, data standards, but do ask questions if you want to about what relevant um, other standards there are. But let's go into the proposal. So we've got three very specific, uh, very small proposals. The first one is individual count. So this is an existing term in Darwin Core, uh, simply the number of individuals represented in the collection item. So uh, it's, um, yeah, it exists for an observation, but in Audubon Core, there are a few different things that happen with bioacoustic data vocalization so if the if the number of individuals is one that's actually quite useful for a lot of researchers or analysts who want to uh, obtain relatively uncluttered single sounds conversely there are multiple individual phenomena duetting chorusing uh, which are uh, of wide interest so this is it does have specific relevance to audio, essentially, is the motivation for importing this. So there is a GitHub issue for it. Uh, it's right there. Please do comment. And um, yeah, Ed, just interrupt me if there's anything else you want to say about these issues. I'll just go through all three of them. Yeah. The second one is sample rate, as Ed mentioned. So. Uh, this is about the audio, right? So the uh, audio always has a sample rate um, in, in the data, digitized data, audio that is. Uh, and the reason that it's important is that it acts as a hard limit on the sound frequency ranges that can be represented in the data. 
So if you've got um, a sound recording recorded at eight kilohertz, you have no way of representing um, a sound that exists at 13 kilohertz. So it's, it's very important for almost anyone working with audio. Um, the previous, uh, there is some, uh, in, uh, sorry, I've forgotten right now, but there is another Audubon core term where people can put that in a free text section. But of course that's no use for um, specific searching. So uh, just import that. Now, um, the music ontology I've referenced on this slide, the music ontology, um, is a an ontology, so a kind of structured uh, term list, which is developed for the music industry and for music informatics. Um, it is sort of, it's quite widely used in the sort of data side of the music industry and quite well developed and um, it's uh, pretty well thought out, uh, frankly. And the sample rate is simply a numeric value in Hertz. Uh, and we could just specify that as a standalone new term, but we're proposing to import it from this music ontology, which just gives it a bit more of an anchoring. So there, there is another issue for that. Please do comment on that um, now or in the future. Oh yeah, one thing I should say, um, I think uh, Steve can correct me on this, but the standard way of doing this is that um, Within TAD, we, we have these proposals which go out for public comment and there's a particular 30 day period which um, we're, we're trying to gather uh, public comment in order to, uh, to help firm up the proposals. The third of our term editions that we want to propose is actually a pair. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm low on battery. I'll have to hurry up. <laughs> the frequency low, uh, sorry, I'll talk while I get my uh, power cable. The low frequency and the higher frequency. So I mentioned the uh, sample rate in the data. So the sample rate, which was the second proposal, that's about the, the recording itself. But the low and high frequency are of the phenomena represented in the multimedia item. So it could be the low and high frequency of this core which we've recorded uh, within the audio file. It's a very commonly annotated attribute. Uh, it can be used to validate taxon identity or to look at specific phenomena within a taxon. Um, and as I've hinted before, it's actually possible and, and fairly in various contexts it comes up that you you can these terms could be present or absent in, in, in different conditions. So it could be, for example, possible to annotate the low frequency for this call, but because of having a sort of stack of harmonics going all the way up, it might not be possible to, to uh, specify the, the high frequency. So these terms are proposed as separate standalone terms, but obviously they're very closely related to each other. And again, it's a numeric value in Hertz. So the third issue is there. Again, it's on GitHub. So uh, the next bit of the slides is about the annotation model, but I'll just pause for a second in case anyone got any questions. I'm sharing my screen so I can't actually see the text chat. So if anyone wants to alert as to a question, please do. So there is a comment here from David Bloom. Um, please be careful with the definition of individual count. The complete definition is the number of individuals represented present in the time of the occurrence. This is important because the number of individuals present at the time of the occurrence may be different from the number of individuals retained by a given collection or represented in a recording. So that actually kind of segues into the annotation thing because uh, the individuals in a complete recording might be different than the individuals in a particular uh, annotated segment. Well, that is a really good point. Um, I think maybe others can comment on this, but certainly you might have, uh, for example, with birds, you might have males vocalizing and the females not vocalizing. So if it's present at the time of the recording, they, perhaps there would be a, some justification for separating out the number of individuals represented in the collection file from the number of individuals represented, uh, present at the time of the recording. Just 
So mm -hmm. if we, uh, I think we probably can have a um, copy of this chat saved. And so what we can try to do is um, capture this comment and put it in the comments for the term proposal. Or David, if you want to just put it in a comment in the term proposal, that would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, so the more long-term or hypothetical or uh, uh, perhaps even tendentious uh, part of this is uh, annotation model. So how to represent metadata for each sound event within a, a collection item. So what I have on this screenshot, and so we've got four rows, by the way, we've got four rows, which is just trying to represent a long audio file within one uh, window. And it's pretty common that we have a recording and we don't trim them down to individual audio items. I mean, you can go either way, but there are plenty of cases where um, a recording contains a sequence of sound events and we actually want to annotate information about each of these sound events within the context of the larger recording. So um, this really does relate to a lot of other things. It certainly relates to annotating what's going on temporally within a video item uh, and also to the work of the machine observation group. Um, it's certainly like of, of a sort of high importance to people working with sound. So we want to at least propose what would be useful for people working with this kind of sound data and hopefully integrate with um, uh, the other interests. So there's an example here. Um, we have uh, a spreadsheet of what's going on within a particular recording. So the time of the start, time of the end, um, and uh, I think this comes possibly from, yeah, well, it's, it's something that Ed uh, has in his collection. So we've got various things going on here. So there's the intro, the bottom row, we've got from naught to three seconds, we've got the actual verbal intro to what's um, on there. Pretty common to have these things. Um, and for each time segment, we've got uh, often taxon indicated and maybe even a particular type of sound various stuff going on low and high frequency now um, remember that what we were proposing earlier was about the overall recording but here is an example where this particular um, item within the audio file is also annotated with those so there's this idea of potentially um, propagating some fields down from the larger uh, item into a single event um, now, these events can overlap in time. It's not a segmentation in the sense that there's only one active at the same time. Various metadata can be present or absent at the same time. You see there's the start time is missing from here, presumably to indicate that the sound was ongoing, even at the start of the recording. There are various ways of modeling these things, and I've included this table from an old paper of mine where I tried to um, tease these things apart. So uh, time frequency boxes, which uh, I've mentioned, this is the, what I've got at the bottom here, but actually in the literature, there are a few different ways of doing these things. And it's, um, well, there are various pros and cons of each of them, but at the very least time frequency boxes is a sort of superset of some of these other things. So if you don't know the low and high frequency, then you end up with this uh, segmentation just above, which is um, again, pretty common, just talking about the temporal segmentation and associating metadata with those time regions. Um, but if you don't know the start and end time, then maybe you're just using individual moments as representative of the events you've annotated, for example. I'll skip up with that for now. So again, the music ontology is a good source of uh, inspiration because it's very well developed. It's borrowing from something called the timeline ontology. These things have all been done within the context of W3C a while ago, uh, where events an event has a start, an end, a duration. Uh, of course, there's a bit of redundancy here, so we could have the start and end, or we could have the start and duration. Um, 
the timeline ontology allows for either or in this case. And what we have in the diagram on the right is actually perhaps even more um, getting into detail, but the timeline ontology allows for events to have sub events. It's relatively uncommon, but it's quite good to allow for the possibility of hierarchical uh, tagging of, of uh, temporal events. So you could say here is a region within which something is happening for a particular taxon. Then within that, you can have sub events which are uh, tagging other uh, information. So we're not at this point proposing to adopt this stuff all straight away. This is all for discussion. Um, but I do want to emphasize that this, starting from the music ontology, there's a fairly well thought through uh, source of inspiration. And then, as I said, we can adopt from the item level terms other uh, plenty of terms which can be propagated down to individual events. Taxon is a very obvious one. Okay. So uh, that's the summary. That's the final slide there. I think we just go back to. Uh, for discussion. All right, does anybody uh, specifically have questions for Dan and Ed before we move on? All right, um, so I think this is an appropriate point to sort of um, segue into the, the, the last part of the meeting, which is to talk a little bit about um, priorities for the upcoming year. Um, one of the things that I'd like to point out before we jump into that is, um, a, a little bit about sort of the general structure of how uh, the vocabulary maintenance specification and the standards documentation specification see vocabulary standards. So as you can tell from sort of the discussion so far, Audubon Core at its basis is this big basically bag of terms where we have um, a, a lot of terms that are defined but there's not a lot of specifics about how they should be used um, if there's any kind of restrictions on the values and so on. And so, this, so the idea is that you have kind of this basic bag of terms level. And then on top of that, you can build additional things. So this is what I'm showing here is actually part of the vocabulary maintenance specification that basically says tattered vocabularies have a flat basic layer of terms, but they can be enhanced by building on top of this. So for example, uh, it, constraints on literal value types, establishing relationships among classes by applying a domain model and, and so on. And we are seeing this um, somewhat with the work of the uh, 3D group and also the stuff that Ed and Dan talked about with relationship to sound, which is that um, within specific parts of Audubon core, uh, there may be uh, sets of Audubon core terms that are more important to one media type than the other. There may be uh, constraints that one part of the community may be interested in and others not. And so, the idea that uh, is that we sort of build on top of this basic layer of terms um, with things which are called sort of uh, generically uh, extensions, um, adding extensions onto the vocabulary. And so the uh, vocabulary maintenance specification has kind of a section down here about developing vocabulary enhancements. And I'm not going to go into the technical details, but essentially, you know, we have this idea of an Audubon core record, but an Audubon core record is so generic that there's almost nothing specific about what's required. I think there's two required terms, but you could have a, a application profile or something more specific relating to sounds or relating to 3D images or something like that. 
that could be developed as, as an add-on on top of the standard. And so we see this happening in the, with sounds. We see this happening with, three, with 3D images. Um, there was an expression over the past several years that it would be great to have user guides, like a user guide for video and a user guide for still images and so on. All of these things basically happen when there are people who step up and say, I'm willing to take leadership on this. I'm willing to put in the work to put all of this stuff together. And so like if you're if you're at the meeting and you're, and you're wondering, okay, so why are why are why is the group working on 3D and working on sound? And the answer is because there are people who stepped up and want to do the work on that. Um, there was a a lot of people who expressed an interest in there being a best practices guide for still images. And I see that as like a very high priority for us, but somebody needs to take leadership on making that happen. Um, so the maintenance group does not, uh, you know, the maintenance group sort of takes care of the overall management of the bag of terms and trying to get people interested in um, in some of these in uh, media type specific enhancements, but the maintenance group itself can't do this. And that's where uh, creating task groups would come in. So, um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, one of the things that we're sort of required to do is to go through the issues in the issue tracker um, once a year. And because there are so few items in the issue tracker, we've basically talked about all of the proposals except uh, two. There was one proposal for um, comment date that, um, that that is a missing term along with all the other commenter terms. But um, it was also noted that, that we perhaps need to look at a more generic annotation vocabulary that's not a part of Audubon Core. So that one basically uh, did not get proposed to go to public comment. The other was that it would be good to include the Dublin Core term publisher, but then there was some discussion about what is the difference between a publisher and a provider. So I think in both of these cases, there is some need for these terms, but they need a champion, basically somebody who's willing to put in some work to figure out, um, you know, to, to find out how are they using, being used conventionally uh, and to come up with proposals for that. So I think they, uh, the, what we're supposed to do is basically move terms to public comment, kill them or leave them in the tracker. And most of the ones that we have are already in public comment except for I think these two, and I guess my um, opinion at this point is that they haven't been in the issue tracker very long, and I think they could probably sit there for another year, and hopefully someone who's interested in them would, uh, would pick up work on them. Um, so I think that pretty much covers the issue tracker, other than issue number 63. Issue number 63 is basically we need user guides. It's the oldest issue that's in there. It, it could be in there forever, but it's mostly just a reminder to us to try to um, find people who are willing to become champions for user guides and guidelines for sets of appropriate terms for different media types. And so if anyone who's participating in, the, in the, uh, this meeting has uh, experience with uh, especially still images, best practices um, with respect to uh, collecting still image data and getting it into GPIV. We really could use a task group to come up with a user guide for that. Um, video hasn't gotten mentioned and the only reason it hasn't gotten mentioned is because we haven't had any participants who said they're interested in video. So if video is your thing, then get involved and we can work on video in the same way that we're working on sound. Um, it was also recommended that um, 
if you are attending the meeting and you're willing, at the top of the um, document, I had <laughs> attending. It looks like there's 75 people. I don't know if all 75 of you want to uh, record your presence here. But if you are interested in the work of the group, I would encourage you to go ahead and just add your name to that list. And at a minimum, we'll know that you're, you're interested in what the group is doing. Um, as I said, if you, uh, we will plan an upcoming meeting and put it in the issue tracker. So um, check the issue tracker and, and everyone is welcome to come to the meeting. So I think that's probably the best, uh, best way to get involved. So we're down to our last 15 minutes here. And I think at this point, um, we'll just open this up to any general questions about Audubon Core, about any of the proposals uh, or specific things that presenters have talked about. And uh, we'll use up the rest of our time in that way. If you, if you prefer to put a question in the chat, that would also be great. So let's take a look at, okay. Rich Pyle says, we have a large library of video. He can help lead that effort. That would be awesome. Uh, the annotation interest group has a meeting on Friday at 1200 UTC. Yeah, I think one of the things that the issue of annotations keeps coming up, uh, both in the context of uh, annotating uh, parts of sound recordings we have similar issues on in, uh, annotating parts of still images and segments of videos. So this is kind of a general issue. Um, so I think definitely annotations are something that we need to look at and, and the best practices for doing that is probably something that goes beyond, uh, well, I guess one question is, is annotating a media item the same thing or different than an annotation in general? And maybe people have some discussion about that, uh, but this is definitely something that um, that's worth a lot of discussion. Question is, when is the next meeting planned? Um, we have been having meetings about once a month. So um, I think we'll probably, I, I think one thing that would be useful is <laughs> to know who wants to attend and uh, figure out the appropriate time zone. We, we already have uh, Americans, Europeans, and uh, people in Australia, <laughs> which is, pretty much boxes us in on times when people are awake. But if we know who's interested in participating, we can try to pick a, a meeting time where people don't have to get up in the middle of the night. So if you are interested in attending and you're not in a US, Western Europe or Australian time zone, please let me know. Otherwise, we'll probably suggest a meeting time that the, the one that we normally meet at that's sort of optimized for that group. Okay, let's see. When is the meeting planned? Where do you add your name to the list? Yeah, if you want to just put it at the top, that would be great at the top of the document. Where will you note what guides would be useful? Um, I think that uh, if people have suggestions about uh, guides, you can insert it in the notes under uh, priorities for the upcoming year or user guides languishing since the ratification of the standard. That's, I guess, basically stick it in the Google Doc somewhere and then we won't lose it. <laughs> I would, I guess, ultimately like to see us have a guide for all the major media types, which would be still images, moving images, 
sound, and 3D images. Um, I, I think those are probably the major ones. And, and right now we don't have any of them, although, as I said, 3D and sound we're working on. Okay, Matt says, at present, I think the GBIV blog post on multimedia is the best guide on publishing images to GBIV. That's useful. Rich says, we're in the middle of Pacific. We almost always have to get up in the middle of the night. Sorry, Rich. Um, if anybody would like to unmute and talk, that would be, uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, just thoughts about anything we've talked about so far. If it's all right, if we have time, um, I, I'd like to go back to that point that was made about the uh, individual count, because I actually don't, uh, so the, the, the warning that was raised was that um, individual count is about the individuals present not necessarily represented, but actually the, the, in Darwin Core, the phrasing is quite weird. It says the number of individuals represented present. And I'm not sure if that means represented and present, <laughs> or mm -hmm. it's actually, um, I, I'd appreciate if we can get that clarified in Darwin Core actually, but uh, not quite sure where to take that. Well, I'll tell you, um, Darwin Core is having a, maintenance group meeting just like this one in what two days from now I think and um, so I think one thing to do would be to put this put this question in the issue tracker and uh, I'm planning to be present at the Darwin core meeting although my head is spinning with all the different things I'm thinking about so um, I can try to bring that up and if you put it in the issue tracker that's more likely to get uh, brought up yeah, so I'll put in the Darwin core as you track it. Can I make a quick comment about number of individuals in Darwin? Sure. Please do. I think originally the Darwin core, I'm speaking from marine species, the data sets, is generally you counted the number of critters or species in a, in a, a sample. And then we got into looking at other things and you might, you're not looking at individuals, you're looking at groups of organisms. So it might be a pod of whales. So how many pods did you see? How many flocks of birds did you see? And things like that. And so that might work better for, for your purposes. First, define what the scope of your organisms are. Are you count, looking at individuals or are you looking at groups of individuals? It's just a comment. Thanks. Yeah, I think that I think this is like um, fairly uh, intimately related with the whole annotations issue. Um, I mean, there is an issue of whether we're concerned about what organisms are present and what organisms are represented in the media item. I think that if we can define the, the uh, segment of the media item, either a segment of a still image or a bounding box on the sound, then whether other organisms were present or not is a thing that we can't know based on that evidence. So I guess I would say that the occurrence that we're documenting is the occurrence of the organisms that we have evidence for. So if we can um, delineate what the exact uh, segment or part of the media item is that we are talking about, then I think we are able to specify how many individuals were involved in that piece of it. I mean, it's it. If there's five birds singing and a hundred per, birds present, but we don't know that those other ninety-five birds are there, it's, it seems almost irrelevant to me. Unless it seems to me, then the, then you would create a separate occurrence record, 
and the evidence supporting that occurrence record would be a notebook or something. And then you could so tie those two occurrence records together. But it seems to me like there would just have to be separate, that, that each occurrence record would be supported by some sort of evidence uh, and the number of individuals present in that evidence would be the relevant piece of information. I don't know, that's how I'm thinking about it. Uh, yeah, that's fair enough. As, as we, if we just get the uh, the wording of the Darwin Core definition clarified for that, that's fine by me. Um, can I just just one thing? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch the name of who was uh, speaking just then about pods, but um, Mary Kennedy. Mary, so thank you. Uh, there was organism quantity and organism quantity type that just sort of came up uh, as related and. That can be a biomass or it can be individuals. It could presumably also be uh, pods and other things. That's in Darwin Core and might be useful for this more flexible way of indicating uh, quantities. Well, I think, like in lots of cases, Dan, we're just looking for is it one or lots? Yeah. So, is it, I've done this in the lab and I've got an individual, or is it a chorus? Yeah, very commonly, yeah. Yeah. Is there a mechanism to indicate lots as, or greater than one? <laughs> I don't know if that's a valid value for individual count or not. Yeah. <laughs> very physical solution, one or infinite. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, so, also, things like rivalry songs, there's always going to be another thing because you don't go and get angry and shout at nothing, generally. And like courtship songs, you can assume there's going to be another one. And just going for like historic metadata we've got, often it's just like five individuals in cage, in which case that does kind of work, the individual count. So one thing I guess I should note, uh, and a practice that Audubon Corps has adopted, whether it's uh, proper or not, I don't know, it's just facts on the ground. We have adopted terms with uh, usage guidelines. So there's actually a metadata field that says, if you're using this term in Audubon Corps, this is how you should use it. And that's how we have in the past dealt with situations where we're borrowing a term and the term doesn't give the degree of specificity that we would like. Now, given that we're talking about a Darwin core term, which is an internal Tadwig term, then we should be able to work out a clearer definition. But there is certainly the possibility, and we've done this for other terms, to say that the term definition is this. When we use it in the context of Audubon core, this is what you should do. So for example, if Darwin core doesn't say anything about how do you represent uh, counts that are indefinite but more than one, we could put that kind of guidance in the term when we borrow it. Um, th then the issue would be if a numeric value is expected, then we, you know, we probably don't want to have like a greater than symbol in there. So I think we'd have to work that out. The Darwin core is usually very vague about the values. And so I think that's where when I talk about sort of building this other layer on top of basic terms, this is what we're talking about is saying, if you're, if you're using this term for sound, this is the best practice for how to provide this value. This is something that we are, we're allowed to do uh, essentially as a, as a maintenance group. Hey Steve, this is Richard Pyle. Can I jump in with another related sure. thing you just mentioned? So a moment ago you were talking about the relationship between occurrences and quote unquote evidence. And we've talked about this concept of evidence before. I think in Darwin's semantic web you call it token or something like that. Um, have you guys in the Audubon core group thought about how um, media can serve as evidence in that context? Is, there, are, is Tadwick ready to move in the direction in the way we did with organism to start thinking about a class for evidence and, and how it ties 
not just media, but other sources of evidence together? Or do you think we're not quite ready to go there yet? I mean, I think you guys in Audubon Corps are probably closer than anybody else to be thinking about the relationship between these media items and occurrence records and things like that. And I just wanted to know what the status of your thinking was. Um, we have not really thought about that. I mean, I think one of the issues, and I think this is a Tadwig wide issue, is how do you represent data models that aren't flat? And I have sort of advocated that it might be nice to look at JSON-LD as a way to do this. I know like the taxon name and concepts group also have concepts that are not flat. And so I think there's, we're getting to the point where we need to have some mechanism to communicate that we have these separate things and this thing is related to that. The only thing we really have in Audubon core with respect to stuff that's not flat is this idea that you have a media item, one media item which can have many service access points and the Audubon core structure document indicates some sort of kludgy ways of dealing with that, but it's not something that we have, um, that we have a very robust way of dealing with. And I think in the case of like segmenting uh, audio or video or something, we need to have a way of relating the segments to the media item. And, and so that's definitely something we need to look at. And we, we, um, have, we do have resource relationship in Tadwig. I mean, and that's sort of a generic way of representing uh, yeah. you know, structure. Um, but that's, it's like you say, it's kludgy. But I was actually thinking more in terms of, are we ready yet for a whole class the way we were for organism to represent this sort of intersection of media and occurrences and other evidence of occurrences or, or whether or not we're not quite there yet? Yeah, I think, so we're out of time. So I'm gonna need to draw this to a close uh, in the interest of staying on schedule. I would just say uh, there is a group, the, the uh, ABCD Darwin Core uh, model, uh, I don't know what you call it, re resolving those models. I think this might be a good place to bring that up uh, because it, it's really essentially talking about a domain model for Tadwig and I think that would be an appropriate thing there. Uh, I would just answer Patricia's question, is there a term to define a specific segment of a media item still image in Audubon Core? The answer to that is no, but it's a very parallel question to what Dan's been talking about with video. And I think we have talked a little bit about like the triple IF um, fragment identifiers as a possible way of indicating segments, but it's something that we need to work on. So uh, thank you so much everyone uh, for participating and uh, as I said, the Google Doc is where we're sort of trying to capture everything. So if you have comments or you want uh, to put your email address so that we can you know, contact you about future participation, please feel free to do that. Um, thank you very much for attendance and your comments. Really appreciate it. Thanks, and I Steve. guess at this point, we'll turn it over to our um, <laughs> our uh, Tadwig admin Zoom person. Do we just shut the meeting off, um, Holly? Yep, I'm stopping the recording. Um.